16 days and still no resolution to the confrontation in Egypt. Where is all this going? Are we living through an epidemic of unrest which carries off a generation of autocrats? We're going to spend all tonight's program trying to make sense of what the unrest is. Is it really part of a revolution? Mohamed El Baradi tells us there can be no let up until Egypt's autocrat retires from politics to count his money. We'll discuss the chances of that here and in Cairo. Revolutions and reactions to them made much of the modern world, but they're easier to read in their births than in what they give birth to. The overthrow of the old autocracy is just the first act, of course. The weak central government that usually follows can be buffeted or overwhelmed by all sorts of different forces. We'll ask the historians Simons Sharma and Sivag Montefiore how important this uprising is. And whether it's London or Cairo, protests are now spawned in cyberspace. What could Mao have done with a microchip, Lenin with a laptop? The Egyptian government reopened the pyramids to tourists today, pretense that things are getting back to normal. They're not. Over two weeks on, the president is still in office, and the protests demanding he quit the stage get no feebler. In fact, they were augmented today by scattered strikes. The language of the authorities gets more gothic, too. The deputy president was talking today of the dark bats of the night emerging to terrorize the people, whatever that means. Our reporter Tim Huell has just returned from Cairo. Cairo, January the 28th. Years of suppressed rage boiled over in what looks to some like the start of a textbook revolution. The oppressed Egyptians are already filled with anger and oppression for, for, for the past 30 years. They were just waiting for a spark. The middle-class youth are, are the ones who fueled this spark. Educated activists using Facebook and Twitter first called the protesters out. They followed the scenario of Tunisia's revolution a fortnight earlier. The scale of the demonstrations took even them by surprise. This is a chaotic, spontaneous uprising by ordinary Egyptians of every kind. Existing political groups have got left far behind. They were met with all the apparatus of a police state. Water cannon, tear gas, rubber bullets. But as in many revolutions, that only spurred the crowd on. Can we film The battle ebbed and flowed, but it was clear who was on what side. Until the end of that day, when suddenly it wasn't. As darkness fell that evening, I watched the army arrive in central Cairo. The soldiers didn't shoot, and emboldened, the protesters mobbed them. They were even trying to treat them as liberators. But there was no fraternisation in return. I will be punished if I say anything at all. The refusal of the army to get involved has left everyone here feeling a bit heady, but perhaps rather too heady. The Egyptian regime grew out of the army. They retain still very close links. We know very little about the army. There may be divisions within the army in terms of decision-making because that would lead to the kind of chaotic situation which could spiral out of control. Chaos had already broken out after police vanished from the streets, along with many others. 
He ruined shopkeepers, believed the regime was provoking anarchy to justify its rule. As citizens turned into vigilantes, it became ever harder for foreign journalists to work. At every corner in this neighbourhood now, there are youths standing with long sticks and more and more are gathering all the time. We've decided it's not safe for us to stay here. We were stopped by mobs and arrested by state intelligence. Earlier, this close friend of President Mubarak had to fight to protect us from a pro-government crowd. But he brought them out onto the streets and he blamed foreigners for Egypt's turmoil. Part of the reason why they were so nervous in receiving us is that the media has been, the, especially the foreign media, has been unfair to Egypt in the last few days. The people the government regards as the real Egypt found their voices the morning after Mr Mubarak promised to stand down at the end of his current term in September. Thousands said that that's all they'd wanted. Could they please now get on with their lives? We have achieved these young men who led this revolution, everybody. They have done it. For two days after that, pitched battles raged as some government supporters, including plainclothes police, backed by camels and horses, fought to clear Tahrir Square of protesters. Yeah. But the real threat to the revolution is subtler, that it may be stifled by slow concessions. The regime has now raised wages for government workers, and it's offered dialogue with the opposition. Mr. President has welcomed this national agreement. He stressed that it will put us back on our feet, on a path out of the current crisis. So far, the concessions aren't working. Crowds on Tahrir Square yesterday were as large as ever. And the new era should start. This is our position. Am I clear enough? With the latest figures showing that 297 have died for this revolution, the protesters won't give up easily. But the regime's proving stubbornly immovable. It says Egypt's not ready for democracy. The revolution burned Mubarak's party headquarters. It may yet dislodge him before he wants to go. But to send his whole system up in smoke will be harder still. Well, coming in now from Cairo is Gigi Ibrahim, who's been in Tahrir Square from the beginning, helping organize the protest. Um, Gigi Ibrahim, what did you achieve today? Uh, today we achieved a great thing since the beginning, really, of this uh, revolution. Thousands and thousands of people have come out and, and, and spoke for the first time, demanding their rights, and, and they're not letting go, and they're more determined than ever um, to really have Mubarak step down. Sure, but you're no further forward than you were two weeks ago. Isn't the likelihood this is just going to fizzle out or be suppressed? Uh, I think we're stronger than ever. Uh, workers have gone, have started really going on strike today in many cities, in Helwan, in Suez, in Mahalla. Uh, transportation workers have gone on strike. Uh, thousands of people yesterday came out to Tahrir for the first time after uh, the very uh, inspirational and uh, sensational uh, Wa'il Ghunim's interview. And uh, I think more than ever, the revolution momentum has uh, been growing and growing and uh, uh, persistent and more determined to get the demands met. Uh, so what time frame are you looking at now? Now we're looking at uh, escalating the situation, increasing the pressure until uh, really the government and uh, Mubarak especially adheres to those demands that have been uh, very loud and clear in all of Egypt, in all of the streets. Uh, everybody is speaking about them, it's in the media, I mean, the, the demands are out, thousands of people have demonstrated for them, uh, hundreds have died, um, many were injured, I mean, 
people are putting their lives at risk for those demands are met, what message could be any louder than this? OK, well, look, stay with us because we're going to explore some aspects of this uh, revolution uh, a little later in the program. But thank you very much for now. Uh, now, earlier I spoke to the man who's been the focus of much of the dissent, the Egyptian opposition leader, Mohamed El Baradi. I began by asking him how much longer the protest could last. Jeremy, I think my reading that they will continue uh, in even a larger number as long as, as they see the back of Mr. Mubarak. It has become an obsession that Mr. Mubarak should, should re retire, should cede power. There is the question, Jeremy, is, is a question of credibility. As long as Mr. Mubarak is there, nobody who, who, who is anybody who has control on, on, on the demonstration uh, will, will start the dialogue. And when you hear Mr. Uh, Suleiman, the vice president, a couple of days ago, saying the Egyptians do not have the culture of democracy, uh, how, how do you think p people would, would trust such, such an individual at, uh, to, 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 to lead the country into democracy? But the protest can't go on forever. No, it can't go on forever. But it will, if, if you get five, six, seven million people going into the street and the regime is deaf-mute, doesn't want to listen to them, my fear that it will go bloody. And that's, that's the last thing we want to see here. Yeah, but it, but it, it is still incoherent. It, it, apart from not liking what you have now, the Mubarak dictatorship, apart from that, it is incoherent, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is, quite, it is quite incoherent, but I think we are, you know, as I see, we are, we are the opposition, if you like, the people who own this revolution, which is the Egyptian people, are organizing themselves, Jeremy. I think we are pretty soon going to declare a, 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 a roadmap for a transitional, a transitional period, which is based on a presidential council of three people. One of them would be from the military to ensure stability, a, a caretaker government, and a year where the country prepare itself for fair and free election. I think what you are going to see soon is that, that the Egyptian people be in the driver's seat and not leave it to the outgoing regime. And uh, it is right now, it's, it's totally messy right now. Sure, but when Mr. Suleiman says this is a country which has no real history of democracy, he's right, isn't he? Well, he's right to say that, <laughs> that we have no real history of democracy. He's right, but he should ask himself why we didn't have any real history of democracy because of 60 years of dictatorship. This is the regime doesn't really begin to understand the meaning of liberty, democracy, rule of law. So uh, w w they just need to go. They just need to understand that their time has come to an end. But isn't the likelihood at the end of all of this that you will end up with yet another military-based government? I don't think so. I think, I think what you see right now is, is it's really a popular revolution. It, it, it's people revolution, Jeremy. We, I don't think people have the stomach at all, nor will accept another military government. But you're right, Jeremy. I mean, in this chaos, you know, the army at one point might have to intervene. Hopefully they will intervene on the side of, of the people. Hopefully the foreign governments will intervene on the side of the people and, and let go of Mr. Mubarak. Now, the West has been both cautious and confused in, in, in its response. What would you like the West to do? Well, I think the West, to, to, to be very clear, that we are fighting for universal values, peace, rule of law, democracy, human rights. They have to make clear that they are on the side of the people and not still hanging on to Mubarak in the name, as I said, of pseudo stability. They have to be loud and clear, telling Mr. Mubarak, time to go, you lost legitimacy, you lost, you lost any credibility, time to go, deliver, deliver the power to the Egyptian people. The Egyptian people have enough talents uh, to, to be able to run their own affair, transitional year of to prepare for free and fair election and have a democracy. It would not be the perfect democracy, but at least we'll put ourselves on the right track, Jeremy. Mohamed El Baradi, thank you for joining us. Well, the protests in Egypt give Western governments a real dilemma. All believe in the inherent superiority of democracy, yet have been content to see despots of one kind or another look after what they believe to be Western interests in the area. As Mark Urban observes, the trouble with revolutions is that you can't necessarily predict how they'll turn out. You say you want a revolution. 